just wanted to start, in fact, where I started with Tim Sloan uh, an hour or so ago, and that is to say that clearly there is more bearishness out there in the stock market. When you talk to your customers and look at all the data you get from, from all of them, does it match up with that bearishness or are they still pretty positive? You know, to the, it doesn't match up in what you're seeing the underlying activity. But I think you have to back up a little bit and think as we came into 18, there was a view of a synchronized growth in the world and everybody was going to grow. And as you get to the end of 18 and think about 19, the basic prediction for the U.S. economy, our predictions go from 3% growth to 2.7. The world to basically be flat year over year. And so now you're setting up in the discussion about 19, the economies are slowing, but that growth rate for the U.S. would be one of the fastest growth rates for the last decade. So mm -hmm. there's sort of a half full, half empty view out there. Now, now let's drop into what the real consumers are doing. Over the holiday weekend, the consumers of Bank of America and our debit and credit cards spent 6% more than they did last year which was up 7 or 8% from the year before, so you're seeing strong continued growth. In spending cash across the whole franchise, year to date through the end of November, or nearly the end of November, we're up 9% from last year in terms of cash spending on you know, goods and services. Mm -hmm. Inside that, you're seeing, yes, retail's you know, growing, especially in the Christmas season, but you're also seeing a lot on travel entertainment and dining out, which frankly is good for employment, mm -hmm. in, a, in the sense that those things take a lot of people to make happen. And so I think we feel very good about the U.S. economy. The prediction was a slow a little bit, but underneath that is a strong growth rate that we feel very strong about. Unemployment, wage growth, all the factors are very strong, including small business enthusiasm that we just put out the other day. You were in Buenos Aires last week ahead of the G20. How did you gauge what came out of that? Was it better or worse than, than you'd hoped for in terms of the trade truce? Well, I, think, I think the expectation was building as I was there that you'd hear an announcement that the two largest economies in the world are going to try to work something out. In the end of the day, a perspicacious reporter like yourself knows there's a trade debate going on. Mm -hmm. There's a good argument about what's right. The largest economies ought to be reciprocal. They ought to be open because the smaller economies have disadvantages that they have, we have to help them develop and come along. But the largest economies ought to be able to go at it and be competitive and let's see who wins. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the debate that's going on. How you do that, it's a lot of work and you're going to see ebbs and flows. But that's on people's minds. And the belief was coming into it, you'd hear sort of a, 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 a calming down. And I think in the last couple of days, you've heard both sides of that. And, and that was coming out. And that was the main theme, I think, in terms of global was about trade and about the impacts of a trade war on all the economies, even though it might be a couple economies involved. Is that the biggest risk to your business in 2019 or, or is interest rates? And, and what level of rate hike would, would you be absolutely fine with? You know, at the end of the day, I wouldn't, there's not a being fine with anything. The question is why is the Fed raising rates? It's because the underlying economy is strengthening and taking accommodation out. That is a very constructive environment for every business in the U.S. and frankly the world because the amount of consumption goes on in the U.S. Two-thirds of the U.S. economy is consumer and more. That is an economy the size of China's economy. Mm -hmm. It's a sign of multiples of other, any other economies. So it's key that the U.S. economy grow. And so if the reason why rates are going up is because the economy is growing, that's a good thing. Our expectation is long the markets a few rate rises next year. There's great debate about how fast or slow they'll go. I think watch the Fed, they're data dependent, and that's, they've told you that, and there's mm -hmm. no new news here. But the reality is the underlying economy is growing, and I think the risks for inflation are not high, but it's, the inflation has been growing, wage growth is stronger, unemployment, so you'd expect them to keep normalizing the rate path, and our expectation is they move it up three to three, you know, three, mm -hmm. three and a quarter, we've been over a normalized rate environment. So, so you're pretty relaxed about rate rises, so, so was Tim Sloan uh, earlier, yet we do see the yield curve inverted, the three to five year part. And your stock price, as we look at it live, is down 3.4% today, largely because of that yield curve aspect. So, so what are investors missing then when you see such a, a big one day sell off in relation to this factor that, that you're very relaxed about? Well, over the last five days, the stock price is basically flat. So you can pick which day you're happy or not so happy. Right, but in general, yeah. the, well, there's run, no argument that, that people don't like this flattening of the yield curve. For, for, well, they don't because stock. they think it's recession. So you've got to go back to the economy prediction. When, you know, as some people say, you know, the yield curve is predicted the last 12 out of the last five recessions. There's that debate going sure. on. But the idea is uh, consistent with what goes on as the economic transition comes is a potential yield curve uh, mm -hmm. tight, as the Fed tightens, the long rates stay down, the expectations. So the question is whether it's causation or outcome is a great debate among economists. But the reality is what you're seeing underneath is a prediction that next year's economy is going to grow. So it is very different in a lot of ways because what, if you look back historically, our experts will tell you, you have to remember that the environment around the world is much different. Mm -hmm. The nominal rate environment is much different. You know, U.S. 
uh, treasuries at 3% versus German 10-year uh, treasury at the same mm -hmm. duration. You have 40 basis points. Right. The, the flight to quality, the flight to yield, and all that is, is messing up a lot of things. So if it's inverting because the recession's, if recession's coming, that's not good for anybody. If it's inverting because there's technical aspects like the quality and are trying to take the combination, that's actually not bad. Mm -hmm. And so the question will be, which it is, we believe it's because the economy is strong and they're taking out the combination. I wanted to ask about uh, Brexit, uh, Brian. You've got all the necessary approvals to fully operate from your Dublin uh, headquarters in, in the Republic of Ireland earlier this week, and I believe you've moved 125 employees there this Monday. Your total headcount in the United Kingdom is 6,500 or thereabouts. If we head towards a no-deal, disorderly hard Brexit, whatever you want to call it, of that 6,500, now that the Dublin offices are fully ready, how many more would move to Dublin? We, we don't know because you don't know ultimately what the rules will be, how it will operate. But if there are no, no rules set, yeah, there's no, no deal. rules, we'll get prepared to operate day one. There won't be a lot of movement. We'll have, as we bring the broker-dealer up in France and staff it up, there'll be another uh, modest group of people work over to staff that. The real question will be, for the next five years, what happens? Mm -hmm. And if there's you know, a hard border between, so to speak, financial border between the UK and the EU, without an accommodation of how things can operate, you're going to have to resettle to even that out. And there's three pieces of business. The EU business, which obviously has to go within the EU, the rest of the world business, mm -hmm. and the UK business. The UK business stays in the UK. The, the question will be, how does the rest of the world business fall for us and our competitors? That will come by how the deals are worked out. So even if there's a hard on, in March, what goes on beyond that mm -hmm. would be more interesting. So near term, we, this isn't that we're going to do something in Dublin. We are done. We have a European bank. It operates in Dublin today. Mm -hmm. It is up and operating. The, the, the UK bank is no longer it merged in. And mm -hmm. so that's up and operating. That won't go back. And the broker dealer will come up in Paris and we'll staff that up. And, and it'll be, you know, we said 100 some people types of numbers. I want to talk about digitalization of, of banking. The big four US retail banks investing around $40 billion uh, uh, in total, $10 billion each. The next biggest, the fifth biggest, U.S. bank corps, spending only $2.5 billion. 4x difference compared to the, the rivals above it. Do you think that this is going to have a similar effect as uh, digitalization has in other consumer-facing businesses? And that is that it's a big boon for the incumbents, but the smaller com companies get left behind. Well, I think we... It's a big boom for everybody in the sense that you can continue to provide better service to the customer and take the cost structure down, which then you can pass through the customer. So the way to think about all this work <clears throat> on our consumer side is we have 26 million mobile customers, 35 million digital customers, about a billion, six, a billion, five billion, six logins last quarter. This is not something that's coming. Mm -hmm. This is something that already exists. 20 odd percent of our sales are done on digital. All this is extremely important to how we run their franchise. What that's done for the customers, given them better services, on their time, the way they want to do it, 24 by 7, at the same time reduce our operating costs so we can give, we take it out overdraft fees on mm -hmm. uh, point of sale debits 10 years ago now almost. And, and that allowed us to afford that was to change the operating structure. So that mix is very good. Small banks and larger banks participating in it. We help small banks. Zelle is made available for the whole industry to drive uh, digital P2P payments. Mm -hmm. The volumes are growing 100% per year for us and that and across the board. So the, the goal is to bring the whole banking system into more and more digital age and make it more efficient for the customers. Mm -hmm. And the key is on the commercial side, it also goes on. Everybody talks about consumer because I can feel it. But on the commercial side, the same impact's going. So mobile cash pro, which is a product we have, our cash manager product is up and operating very efficiently. And we you think that a treasurer of a company wouldn't want to use, would sit down at their desk and do mm -hmm. an interface to send it. They want the mobile interface. That's how they conduct their daily life. And so you go on that, it tells you you have three payments to approve. It's really good stuff. It's all good for all the companies. And, the fact that the competitive edge we're pushing uh, for the large companies versus, is not versus small companies, it's for the industry mm -hmm. overall.